Hello and welcome to the Chili Dog Strings Podcast. I'm Neil Fong Gilfillan. And I'm Rachel Sampson. Thank you for joining us as we open up new conversations in the world of music education. everybody. Rachel Sampson here from Chili Dog Strings for another episode of our podcast. Today we are interviewing Christine Goodner, violin and viola Suzuki teacher from Hillsboro, Oregon, where she teaches from her program at Brookside Suzuki Strings. She also offers Suzuki early childhood education classes in Hillsboro and Portland through DeCapo Suzuki Early Childhood Education. She has a passion for parent education, lifelong learning, and building the Suzuki community in order to benefit every corner of the Suzuki Triangle. In addition to leading a Parents as Partners talk for the SAA, she has also published articles in the American Suzuki Journal and blogs at www.suzukitriangle.com, one of our favorite online resources. We have brought her here today to discuss her latest project, the book titled Beyond the Music Lesson, Habits of Successful Suzuki Families, which will be released on the 19th of this month. So... Welcome, Christine, to our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So Christine has the wonderful vantage point of having been a Suzuki student and parent, as well as being a Suzuki teacher. She uses this perspective throughout her new book to craft a well-thought-out Suzuki resource that readily describes what the Suzuki family looks like in modern day. Christine, I've had the privilege and pleasure of reading the advanced copy of your new book to be released later this month, and I'm absolutely convinced it's going to be a hit as a valuable tool in the Suzuki community. Would you mind telling us more about your book? Sure, thank you. I'm really excited because I, of course, have all my students' families read Nurtured by Love when they start lessons with me, and I've always wanted there to be some kind of follow-up resource that I could hand them that explained what do we do to make this work in our everyday lives? I feel like Nurtured by Love gives really important and great uh, background on what Suzuki is and how it was created. And then I feel like as teachers, we sort of fill in the gaps on how do we make this successful for them every day at home. And so that was my vision for the book is just that this would give parents a real resource to figure all that. That's all awesome. That awesome. Awesome. I just... um I don't know. I, I tore through it quickly to make sure that I could be prepared for this interview. But like I mentioned to you, you know, every every nugget of wisdom that's in there, it's just like it's so clear and direct. And I took those points and I digested them. And it really sort of inspired me to think about, oh, what can I do with my students? What was this like for me when I was a Suzuki kid? What was my mom going through? Like, I just really feel like it's a very... A uh, holistic approach to the Suzuki experience. It's so well done. I'm so excited for you. Thank you. Um, and for everyone that is going to have the opportunity to read it and let it contribute to their Suzuki experience. It's going to be awesome. That's, that's what I hope for sure. <laughs> okay. So I have a few questions for you, some about, you know, related to the book and just some related to your experience since you are like, I don't know, I think you have the unique position, which, uh, encompasses all three components of the Suzuki Triangle. So I just have a few questions for you. Um, Can you think back to your earliest moments as a Suzuki teacher who decided that she had something to say and share? Um, What inspired you to start sharing your ideas with others? Oh, that's a good question. I think a lot of what made me a more confident teacher and a more competent teacher is that other Uh, more experienced teachers did that for me, shared their ideas and their experiences. And I feel like I just soaked that up from everyone around me at institutes and in teacher training. And so I just wanted to be able to do that as soon as I felt like I had something to share. And I think also I just, I teach better when I am thinking of how to share ideas I have. It makes me think more deeply about what I'm doing in my studio when I know I want to share the ideas I'm working on. Awesome. So How long do you think it's been, like, your journey so far of sharing ideas and letting your ideas evolve and, um, I don't know, just, like, trying things out and seeing what other people have to say? How long has that been? 
Well, I, I looked back when I first started my blog. It was actually 2011, and the <gasps> blog posts were very bad. But, <laughs> but I think that's when I first started thinking that maybe I had some ideas to share, even though I wasn't particularly good at it yet. Hey, I take comfort in that, though, because I've, you know, I've had some stuff that I put out there this year that, you know, you have to start somewhere, right? And if you constantly edit yourself, you're never going to put anything great out there. So you got to start somewhere. I definitely had a few that flopped this year. And I was like, oh, man, uh, I should just quit now. But you know, that's encouraging to hear that everyone starts there. It's yeah, great. that's how we learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, that's the thing that sort of fosters the same idea about like not being afraid to fail because you always find something valuable tucked away in there, right? Right. Uh, exactly, <laughs> precisely. That's all encompassing Suzuki experience. Right, right. Um, so, one thing, let's see here. Sorry, I got sidetracked. <laughs> um, <laughs> The little snippets that I've gotten to witness as you go through this writing process of authoring a book, mm. you know, bit by bit, I I do feel like they've been very congruent with the Suzuki experience that we're trying to get everyone to take part of, right? Um, sure. Breaking down the concepts into digestible bits for the reader that all taste delicious, might I add. Um, and you seem like such a natural with your writing and you're so organized in how you present your ideas. Um, is there a process that you go through when it comes to writing? Sometimes I'll just come up with an idea and I'll blog about it first. So I might blog about a tiny bit of it and if people respond to it well, I realize maybe it's something worth sharing. And I also write a lot for the studio parents um, that I teach. So sometimes I take ideas from that. But I think the process is a lot messier when I start. I have lots of notes on little bits of paper all over and <laughs> notebooks filled with little little notes to myself that sort of form into ideas awesome. later on. Yeah. Do you do um do you offer like a a newsletter for your studio? Is that what you're talking about? That you write a lot for your studio parents or what does that look like? Not a super formal one, but we do like a parent talk once a year and so I tend to write out what I'm gonna say for that. Awesome. And then I do send out just periodic things that I think parents need to hear. And especially for new students, I do make like a, I have like a four week newsletter that goes out to parents as they come for their first four lessons. So that's more formal, I guess. Very cool. I love to hear more about that sometime. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Anything we can do to set them up for success, right? Right, right. Oh my goodness. Um, Great. So I also think you're really good at making your ideas accessible online. Have you noticed any significant changes in your studio since putting your ideas out on the internet instead of just like directly? Well, I think sometimes parents in my studio surprise me and I realize they're reading the articles on my blog, which is good. They'll come back and say, oh, I heard you write that on the blog. So uh, that's encouraging. I think it helps. It helps the parents to see that other people are responsive to the ideas and it's not just their teacher talking to them. Sometimes they can see the bigger picture when they see ideas are shared and um, bigger like that yeah okay awesome um do you ever find that it that your work online brings you clients yeah I think so yeah I think so okay I yeah. think sometimes people are just searching for a local music teacher and if they see like I have a link to my blog on my studio website so that probably helps yeah. to see that I'm part of something bigger than just teaching in my house you know I think so I think we've experienced a little bit of that too just like putting putting the work that we have online it draws people in in a different way than just finding them in a directory right so right if I were in Oregon oh my goodness if I saw all of that and if I had a little one first call (laughs) yeah um okay so looking back what's something that you wish you had started doing earlier when you started teaching so I guess this is (laughs) this is a question from Neil (laughs) okay I think and I think um he loves to do this and so do I we were both raised this way sort of accessing the wisdom and knowledge of those that are you know older and more experienced that's a very uh similar idea to what you share in your book actually so I'm curious to hear from you if you have any advice you know or things that you wish you had done differently Yeah, I think the longer I teach, the more parent education I do. I think at first, parents would come in and I would just be like, oh, you want to take lessons, right? And then (laughs) I wouldn't really explain exactly what it involved. Um, 
And the, the longer I teach, the more details I share about what to expect. And that's partly why I wrote the book, as I realized the more I put off sharing that information, the more people struggle later, because it really is a big undertaking. And if you're committed to these details coming up, then you're more likely to be successful. But if no one shares them with you, then it's sort of a shock, I guess, <laughs> what you're getting into. Totally. So I wish, I wish I had done that more. I see students I've started with more parent education just are thriving more. So. Okay, more parent education. Yeah. And, um, you know, we definitely recommend reading the resources and everything. I think when, when I meet with incoming families, the biggest thing that I tell them, just like you're saying, is hold on to your hats. This is a lifestyle change, right? Like this is something you definitely have to carve time for. Like it's not just going to happen just because you decided to pay me to take lessons. Um, right. What would you What would you add to that for our listeners? What are sort of like the the golden nuggets that you start off with when you're meeting with a potential family to sort of give them that initial education? I think a lot of things in our culture, parents are more hands off and not as involved. And so I think letting parents know how involved they're going to be, especially if their child's really young. Like, you're a big part of this process, and I'm going to count on you to work with me right. so that your child can learn well. Right. Uh, yeah, I think that's sort of countercultural. We, we tend to have a very independent way of raising children, and so this is different. I think it's a great opportunity to bond with your child and learn how they learn things, you know, in many areas of life. Yeah. So the parent piece is big. That's a huge piece, and I think... Um... This is something that I often discuss with other young teachers who uh, maybe don't share the same experience as you, because I know you are a fairly young mom, and so probably for a lot of your teaching career, you had the advantage of also being a mother, right? Right, right. Um, But for those of us that aren't yet parents, um, or just aren't ever parents, how, I don't know, I just feel like you so naturally integrate that credibility without like rubbing it in people's faces I'm a parent I know what you're going through and so much of the time I feel the absence of that piece you know like I I feel like I'm always having to explain myself like I know I'm not a parent but you know this is what I know and I've been trained la 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 like what um I don't know how do you do that so well or how do you convey that without sort of making parents feel defensive or threatened or judged yeah I mean for me personally I just because I was a parent I I just realize how hard it is and Uh so it's easy it's easy for me to say things without judgment because I know how you know I've been there (laughs) and so I think I think sharing ideas from other people who are parents can help I've heard from other teachers I know who are not parents that this is feeling young is not as hard as not being a parent when they're teaching because it just, there's some credibility that other parents give you. So I think just empathizing or reading about teachers who are parents and their advice and experiences can help because I think parents just want to know you understand my perspective or you hear from me what's hard. And I think the danger if we don't have children is just to kind of brush some of that off and not realize how hard it can be. Right. So I think as long as we empathize and and let them know they're heard, that can go a long way. Awesome. I'm going to have to like get in there and get immersed in some of that. I think that'll be really helpful for our studio. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that advice. Okay. Next question in the book. Okay, in the book, you break down successful Suzuki habits into seven essential elements, which I thought was genius. It's so cute the way you put it on the keys of the the white keys of the piano. I was all into that. Um, And I'm going to list them for the audience listening so they can get a little preview teaser if that's okay with you. Sure. So some of these chapters are uh, number one, be present. Two, daily practice. Three, listening. Four, environment. Five, community. Six, mastery. And seven, big picture. And while I love and recognize the importance of every single one of these points that you walk us through in the book, I was curious to know, um, are there a couple that stand out to you as the absolute most important? Um, and, you know, just elaborate on that and tell us why or Sure. Yeah. Well, I think I sort of put them in order of importance when I wrote the chapters. 
I think they're all important, mm. but some of them are a bigger piece. Like if the, you know, if a couple of them are missing, I feel like the first few are a bigger deal. Totally. And um, depending on how young your child is, being present and not just physically present, but like mentally present during lessons and practice, I feel like if I have parents that are not doing that, I have a really hard time helping their child be successful because I cannot agree more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so many little details that a young child is just not going to be able to hold in their brain successfully. Yeah. And so we're counting on parents to help us with that. And it's hard. It's hard. We have a very distractible culture, I think, with cell phones and fast moving media all the time. And so to sit quietly for half an hour or 45 minutes and really just be engaged with what's going on is not easy. So it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So that's a huge one. And then I think daily practice and listening are both sort of equally the next two important things. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know the Suzuki method is based on language and how children's brains learn language. And so if we don't hear language growing up, we're not going to learn to speak. And in the same way, if we don't hear beautiful music, we're not going to learn to play it as musicians. And so just going to live concerts, playing the Suzuki recording and also playing lots of other great music for your child to listen to is really going to give them like a mental picture of what their instrument can sound like and give them somewhere to, to aspire to, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you break down those points just like that really well in the book. So that is something for all you listeners to look forward to when you read, you know, I don't have this question written down, but I felt very, I was a Suzuki kid I felt very connected to what you had to say about just your experience with the relationship that you built with your parents through mm -hmm. being a Suzuki family. And I, I didn't have the experience of starting before maybe I was out of diapers. You know, I started when I was almost 12 years old. And so my experience was kind of wrapped up in pre-adolescence and adolescence so I feel like it's a very different picture than what Probably. it might look like from your experience and so I was wondering if you um, you know if you want to get anecdotal or if you just want to share a little bit more about what that was like for you and how it contributed to your relationship with your parents I think that would be really lovely for our audience to hear about. Sure so I started lessons about two and a half three so I really don't remember life without playing the violin. So amazing. Honest. That's amazing. It's, yeah, I think it's great. And both my parents took me to lessons and practiced with me, but I think my dad, maybe a little more so, he was um, has his doctorate in music and was really involved in our music education growing up. And I just remember a lot of practice time spent with him. And I think I share in the book, I don't really remember the details of what we practiced, but I just remember feeling like I was the most important thing to my dad at those moments yeah. and feeling really nurtured and like we had a connection and he understood me differently than kind of anyone else I knew. Yeah. And that was really a special thing. Now, was it all fun and games or did you ever have any moments <laughs> of struggle that you'd of be course. comfortable sharing with us? <laughs> I think my poor mom, especially because my dad was the musician. I just remember, you know, telling her like, you don't know anything about music. <laughs> I was yeah it's terrible oh, yeah. I bet a lot of parents can relate to that you know uh and that isn't that like some of the biggest fear that comes from parents that I I don't know that I hear about is oh but I'm not a musician am I gonna mess it up like am I gonna hold them back or anything like that and right. kids they sense that don't they sometimes oh they can be so wicked right and it was probably that 12 13 you know those are hard years oh. so I wouldn't take personally anything said to years <laughs> As a mom of older kids. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. If everyone heard that, don't take it personally. If your kids just, they sniff it out, they get that insecurity and they latch on. <laughs> don't worry yeah, about yeah. it. <laughs> right. And sometimes I think they might just, as a parent, I think sometimes things are said just because, well, maybe this will cause a fight and we'll stop practicing. Aww. And so, I, yeah, I think, yeah, don't take it personally. That's I think there's a lot point. of things that are not about you that kids are dealing with at those ages. So. That's so true. Yeah. 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 Oh man. Take but no, it was back. not all it was not all fun and games for <laughs> <sure>. my poor <laughs> parents. <laughs> um, and then were you the only Suzuki child in your family or Yeah, actually I'm the oldest of four. Okay. And so we all played Suzuki violin at one point. 
And then um, I'm the only one who continued to play all the way through high school, but I have a sister who played harp in, through high school and a brother who um, was in choir and played French horn and toured with the Young Americans, a singing, dancing group. And then I have one brother who stopped as soon as he was allowed. <laughs> but... Every child yeah. is different, right? That's right. Yeah, That's right. absolutely. Yep. Um, how did that contribute, having such a a variety of music happening in your household you know what did that look like for you all we're pretty far apart in age like my sister's 11 years younger than me so oh, there's wow. a big span so I don't remember her practicing at home too much there's some cute pictures of me practicing and her sitting next to me as a little toddler but um I think music was just something it was like the family culture I guess everybody oh, wow played music, especially when we were young, we just all played, we all took lessons. We had a teacher that came to the house and taught all of us violin and all of us guitar. So she came for hours on end and wow. gave lessons. Yeah. That's yep. amazing. Yeah. So it was just, it was just something you did, I guess, especially up through middle school, the start of high school. Very cool. So it, just a very natural part of like the, the woven fabric of your family. Absolutely. Very natural. That's so great. Um, cool. Well, thank you for just giving us a little bit more of an inside scoop, you know, of your background. I, sure. I always love seeing what everyone's picture looks like. Um, so, okay. At the end of the book, okay. Yeah. At the end of the book, I love the way you have resources listed to check out. And I did notice that, uh, notice that you gave us a shout out there and thank you oh, so yeah. much. That's, that's, so great. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you. Um, on top of that network of educators, uh, and I'm including Alan Duncan because I think he does a great job of educating, even if he does classify himself as you know, a Suzuki parent, but he's also a musician, right? right. Um, I think you've built a fantastic resource with your Facebook group, the Suzuki Triangle Community, which yeah. I love because it fosters a positive spirit of sharing. Um, we can share our projects, ideas, struggles, and walk away with something positive like affirmation or encouragement, inspiration, and some new ideas to try. Um, what has it taken to build that kind of community? Um, and have there been any struggles along the way? What, yeah. What would you like to share with us about that? I just... I think setting the tone for a good community is really important. I run the um, Oregon Suzuki Association here, and we've kind of done the same thing here. It's just, I think community means building a tone where no one person's telling everyone else how to think, but everyone feels like they are welcome to share their ideas and are encouraged, whether they're new or more experienced. I think we can all learn something from each other. So that's been the big thing, I think, is setting the tone. Okay. that we're all uh, an equal community. And I think the, you know, an online community is, can be slow to build. So there was a lot of times where I would write things or try to start discussions and then, you know, <laughs> no response, no response. But <laughs> I think it's grown. And I've just invited some people like, please share your ideas and make sure people knew they were welcome to do that. And I sure. think that's helped. That's helped a lot lately. So that's awesome. Well, that's such yeah. a, that's such a welcome gift, Christine, to have someone who creates I think safe space is too much of a buzz phrase these days, but like, you know, just to create a space where, yeah, we can share, we can share what we're doing and get feedback or sometimes crickets. Right. <laughs> that's also a fun like, message. Yeah. That also says something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's so great. Not everyone is, is wired to welcome that kind of an atmosphere and so I just I love what you're doing there and anyone out there that's listening um, who's a Suzuki parent or teacher that's interested in accessing this they can find you on Facebook right 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 okay at the Suzuki Triangle community awesome right. um, let's see if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few more questions. <laughs> this is another sure. one that comes from Neil. Um, did you naturally gravitate toward blogging and writing articles? Or did you ever have phases where you experimented with different mediums like audio and video? And how did you decide that, you know, writing was the thing for you? Well, I actually started out college as an English major, so oh, okay. I'm just... 
a writer at heart, I think. Gotcha. I quickly decided that was not the thing for me to, to major in in college because it was sort of the same thing over and over. But <laughs> yeah, I love, I do love writing and I feel like that's the way I communicate the most easily probably. So okay. I, someday I would like to start a podcast. I have been thinking about that, but um, definitely I think writing just comes naturally. So it seems like a natural way to share ideas. Wonderful. Okay. So that just sort of like sits within your, your sort of natural skill set. That's the thing that feels best to you. Yeah, I've always been a, a big reader, and so that probably contributes, yeah. Gotcha. Speaking of reading, um, in the book, you craft a path of resources that you use to uh, help add credibility and elaboration to your points that you make, your mm-hmm. excellent, excellent points. Um, Daniel Coyle's Talent Code, Gretchen Rubin's <clears throat> Better Than Before, Michelle Monaghan Horner's Life Lens, Seeing Your Children in Color. I love that book. Oh, it's so I great. Um, I need to reread it. I read it right after the conference. It was so great. Um, but anyway, those are a few resources that you list. Were there any resources that you didn't get to name in your book that you would include in a reading list for teachers or parents uh, in the Suzuki community who are seeking to educate themselves or supplement the basics of what they already know? I might have mentioned it briefly in there somewhere, but I really like um, Edmund Sprunger's Helping Parents Practice. Yes, yes. That is, a, that, one. that is a great book, especially for understanding some of the psychology behind practicing with your child. I think mm-hmm. I often hand that book to parents when we get to a sticking point and we're not making progress or there's some trouble with practice at home. I think it really, it really helps. And he has a book called Building Violin Skills. If yes. you're a violin string teacher, that's really great too. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so some resources from Ed Sprunger. Um, are there any others that you, I don't know, have read recently or that you think would be of extra special benefit to people who are looking to beef up <laughs> their thinking about this sort of experience? I really, yeah, I really like Angela Duckworth's book, Grit. And, mm-hmm. um, I think it's good for just understanding why hard work is good for us and kind of the benefit of it and that success isn't always intelligence or how quickly we learn things, but it's a lot of sticking with things and working hard. I think it really has a lot to say about music education too. So that's a great one. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I, one more I would add is Gretchen Rubin has a new book coming out, I think in September about her four tendencies and it's sort of like personality types and how they learn and how they most successfully make habits. And so I have not read it yet, of course, but I'm looking forward to that book because I have a feeling it will have a lot to say, especially about working with middle school teen students. So I would imagine so. That's exciting. I'll have to be on the lookout for that as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, And then I asked you about your experience as a Suzuki child. I'd love to hear a little more about what it was like as a Suzuki parent. I know in the book you mentioned that <laughs> with, <laughs> with your first kiddo, it was really challenging, right? Right, right. Um, and I don't know. I just love to hear more about that. And like, what was the turning point? Did you have some Suzuki epiphany? Like what, what happened that sort of shifted that experience for you? Well, yeah, so I started my youngest when she was four and I was a young mom and a pretty new teacher. And so I think I just like had all these ideals of how it should go and how it would be. And I had this really stubborn, headstrong, she would admit it herself, child. And so <laughs> it was just, it was just fireworks in it. Um, I think if I went back now, I would be able to turn it around. As, you know, for her, we ended up doing something that was non-Suzuki after a few years of, mm-hmm. of that because she just needed to to be independent from me. And yeah, so I wish I could go back and take some of the things I know now, because I think I would be less worried about little details that I was insisting she was doing just right. And I would think more about what's going to make her stick with this long term. And what does she need for her distinct personality instead of what do I think all students should do with things mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. yeah. Definitely. So yeah, I, I think I sort of think of myself as like a a failed Suzuki parent, but not really because they, both my kids did music all the way through high school. They're, they're musicians, but um, 
sort of that experience really made me want to figure out how to help parents do this better. That's kind of sparked all, all the reading I've done and all the help I try to give to parents in my studio because I really, I needed it back then. Oh, that's so great. So they really served as an impetus for you to share what you're doing and get ideas and improve your own teaching and just general Suzuki experience. That's yes, great. absolutely. Awesome. Um, Something that you really hit on in the book is, you know, that last point of big picture. And I really love what you have to say about that, uh, just because I think it's it's very much in tune with the experience I had. Like I said, my Suzuki experience was very wrapped up in my pre-adolescent and adolescent experience. And it was a struggle, you know, <laughs> like... I en- I enjoyed certain parts of it, but a lot of it was just a big struggle, um, particularly with my mom. Um, and I think the thing that always got us through was that prioritization of the big picture. So mm-hmm. there were so many times where, you know, I wasn't the best version of myself and my mom would just call it. She'd be like, you know what? If this is how it is, it's so much more important to me that your heart is right. So put down that violin, you zip up that case, and don't take it out again until, you know, you get right. And Mm. I just, I think, wow, that was so, so huge, so instrumental, like no pun intended, but like Uh so important for me to hear at that stage in my life. Like it doesn't matter what you do. It matters like the kind of person that you are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Now, to sort of juxtapose that statement, you know, there are times, especially as I've moved over the years several times, you know, you always have to restart your studio, restart your studio. And so you get to revisit the foundation so much. Um, How do you balance keeping the big picture in mind and making sure that there's still technical excellence that allows these kids to move forward and become the fullest version of themselves you know like how at what point do you stop like belaboring okay this child has been struggling with their left hand shape for the last six weeks but you know like do you how do you make all that happen sorry I'm not very clear in questioning but no, I, think- I think you understand what I'm asking you I think that's really the art of teaching and the art of parenting. It's a really hard balance. How do yeah. you make sure who people are turning into? And then how do we also just take the details at hand and make sure they're going well? I think, yeah, I think it's a balance and it depends on each student. And, you know, there's been some students who are not going to give the time and attention to their practice they need to to maintain the technique. And maybe the bigger picture is that they're going to enjoy music and not continue with it as something they're going to study. I have a student who I think the family would be fine with me sharing is the number one fencer for his age in the country. And they just had to kind of make a difficult decision. Like, would they continue with violin lessons or keep trying to balance it, but it's kind of getting lost in the shuffle. And the Mm -hmm. big picture is he's played for 10 years. He's going to always love music. You know, we've, we've been a success, but we do have to give a certain amount of attention to technique and, it's just something to keep revisiting, I guess. Okay. I We do parent-teacher conferences in my studio, and we do different things. We had a bowhold challenge this fall. And I think just talking about the details, but making sure the big picture is what's driving them. I see. can be a big piece of that. Yeah. That's big. I like that. So, you know, those are all necessary pieces, but just making sure that the big picture is fueling all of it. I like that. Parent-teacher conferences, this is something that ever since you blogged about it, I've been very intrigued by, um, especially just the component of communicating with your studio families. How do you think that has really helped to improve your studio communication? Um, Has it broken down barriers in in like everyday communication with your parents as well? Like what, how has that helped serve your studio? And would you recommend it? I'm sure you would, but would you recommend it to other teachers? And 
um, what does that look like, I guess? Sure. I was sort of intimidated to start doing it. And <laughs> I went to a parent talk that Alice J. Lewis gave here in Washington. And she gave us her form that she sends out to parents and just really encouraged teachers to to start doing them. And I really wish I had done them earlier. Okay. I, I guess I, I don't know if I was worried parents would tell me I was doing a bad job or what, but I was just sort of like nervous of how it would go. But I really found that it helps get on the same page with the parent. And they really, through going through these questions about goals for the student on each side and what the student has improved on and things like this over the last year, I feel like the parent can see that the teacher is really for the student's success. You know, I think sometimes they just see us giving out instructions on what to practice, but mm -hmm. don't always see the part that's planning the big picture for our students and excited about their progress and where we think they're headed. And so I think it's helped helped with that and it helps me to see where the parent's coming from and more of the background. So I feel like it opens up conversations in between those conferences. We just do them once a year, but I feel like I can more easily email and say, hey, you know, I've noticed this is going on or parents are doing that more with me instead of things just kind of festering until yes. there's a problem that can't be solved. So, yeah. And you find that um, an annual parent teacher conference is enough to keep stuff from festering or are there other steps that you take during the year that also help to facilitate a more open line of communication? Yeah, I do um, a parent talk at least once a year. So mm -hmm. I did it in the fall this past year. And I talked about like some of these seven habits of um, successful families and with everybody. And so I think everyone getting together as a big group and then getting together individually with a parent. And then I definitely encourage the parents as partners through the SAA. It's a video series people can sign up for. And it gives a lot of parent uh, parent ideas from teachers and other parents. So I think the combination really works well. Awesome. Yeah. Is there any one point in those seven points that you feel like you really have to convince parents on more so than the others? Or is it just kind of all over the map for different parents? I think it can be all over the map. Um, I think sometimes like the chapter about mastery really talks about why we review. And I think that can be that can be a difficult one, especially mm -hmm. if parents are not familiar with the Suzuki method before. It's different than other methods where you may learn a piece and then move on, where we keep coming back. Yeah. So um, I think it's really Im important, but not everyone is as excited about doing it as I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that novelty piece that you talk about in the book, for sure, right? Yeah. Right. And as adults... That's what we crave is like new things, but little right. kids really crave repetition. And so <laughs> put aside our own, for what's sure. interesting to us for what they need, you know? Oh yeah. If I could, if I had like a nickel for every time the parents are like, I'm going crazy listening to the CD, yes. you know? <laughs> yes. But it's worth it. The outcome is worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> um, great. So I guess lastly... I just uh, was wondering if you had, you know, when I think of you, I just can't help but think of a triangle. <laughs> I just can't help but think of a triangle. And I was just wondering if you um, had any, like, tidbits of wisdom to share that would be directed specifically at any one corner of the triangle. So, like, you know, for the Suzuki student, what's the number one Thing you would suggest or something you want to share and then the, the parent and then the teacher um, what advice do you have moving forward let's see well I'll start with parents since that's sort of what the book is aimed at um, I think to parents just really thinking about the big picture is probably the biggest piece of advice because the book and what we've talked about today there's a lot of details that we're we're talking about but really you know, who, who are we raising our children to be and how do we help them get there through music? And, you know, musicians is probably one of those answers, but also people who are sensitive and people who've developed discipline. And there's a lot of character qualities we're developing as we become good at an instrument. And so I think keeping that in mind when we wonder why we're listening yet again or reviewing yet again or, right. you know, all the, all the things that take time, um, Keeping that big picture in mind, I think, is a great idea. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. 
And then to teachers, I think we can't explain too much to parents what this process takes. And I think, like you said, if we can explain it without judgment and just like, here, here's the reality. And yes, we know it's hard sometimes. And yes, it's not always our first choice for that day, but here are the things you can do to be successful. I think if we explain that more than we want to or feel like we need to, it's a good thing because parents just aren't doing these same kind of interactive activities with their kids and other sports or things they might sign up for. So it's really a new thing. And as teachers, especially if we've been raised Suzuki students, it's just part of who we are to do all these things. And so we just think, well, of course, everyone will do them. But (laughs) sometimes we have to break it down, (laughs) break it down and explain why really clearly so that people can can adopt them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And students, I would say, especially, you know, I'm thinking of if a student listens to this, it might be older teenager or something like that. But I think their schedules can get really busy and there's a lot of things pulling at us, but the students that take music and use it as something for them that they use to either relax or feel, I don't know, enriched by are the students that I see that really stick with, with their music and students who might have to break their practice into little chunks to get it all in rather than wait for one big hour to magically show up in their schedule, at least for my high schoolers that <laughs> Which <laughs> never does, to. right? So. It never does. So. <laughs> yep, yep. So just use music as something for you that you love to do to either relax or enjoy playing something beautiful versus an assignment that an adult is making you do. And I think that's what keeps us going. Awesome. Oh, I love that. I think one of the, the best points the most golden of golden nuggets that I found in the book was when you said, be a student of your child. And I just, that really stuck with me. And so I don't know if we had to rename the Suzuki triangle to anything, it would just be like the student triangle because we're all just constantly (laughs) students, right? It's just different, different angles of being a student, I think. And um, so I just, I really appreciate your work and I appreciate what you have been offering to the, the greater Suzuki community. And I know uh, we are just so thrilled for your book to come out. I can't wait to send an email and be like, listen, you got to get this book. It's going to change your world. You know, um, I had one Suzuki mom who, you know, she took my advice, which I was so grateful for. And she went and she read some of the, uh, the the resources the original resources authored by dr suzuki you know she came back and her face was so long and i said oh what's the matter and she said it's so harsh you know like i just (laughs) you know and and it's true like dr suzuki he shot straight like right you know it's just like you're responsible you gotta you gotta get this done and you know (laughs) if there's something you don't like it's probably your fault you know but i just love you sort of like took that message and it's still there it burns bright but it's just it burns a little softer around the edges and i love that and so i can't wait for other people to access that um so thank you for taking the time to meet here today and um i know that our listeners are just going to love your resource and you can find christine online and um you know come join the conversation we're all just here sharing ideas and trying to support each other in this noble goal right that's right to meet the big picture um okay well is there anything else you would like to add before we end no, just thank you very much for having me. It's been great to talk, and uh, I hope I hope it's helpful. Oh, it absolutely is. So your hopes have been fulfilled, I think. Um, <laughs> okay, so thanks, everyone, for listening to another episode of our podcast here at Chili Dog Strings. Um, if you like what you heard today or if we can answer any further questions, feel free to reach out online. We're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and you can reach us at our website, www.chilidogstrings.com. 
And if you want to see more of Christine's awesome work, you can go to her website, www.suzukitriangle.com. We'd like to thank our special guest, Christine Goodner, for joining us today and sharing her work. Thank you to friend Brian Wilson for the music on our intro and outro. Thanks for listening to the Chili Dog Strings podcast.